morning. Well, first I have to say thank you so much for having me here this morning. And I, I have been all over this country, it seems, lately speaking. And this is the loveliest place I've had the opportunity to be in a very long time, <laughs> complete with a grand piano and exquisite music. Thank you for that. Um, so I hope everyone is having a very chilly but lovely Sunday morning. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, something that I think all of us are becoming daily more aware of, which Michelle Alexander, who was mentioned, um, has noted is really the civil rights crisis of our century, of the 21st century. And that is this current situation we have with our justice system and uh, what we now are referring to as something called mass incarceration. And I want to talk a little bit about that, but, but first I want to just explain what I mean when I say it's the civil rights crisis of the 21st century, and I hope to make that case for you. But I want to step back from that term a little bit, because I think it's used a lot. Civil rights, what does that even mean? Well, in general, when we think of civil rights, we think of poverty and equity, or educational disparities, or racial injustices, however they manifest themselves. And so how can we say that this thing, this thing in our criminal justice system is the civil rights crisis of the 21st century? And what I want to suggest to you is we say that because, in fact, this situation we're in, this current justice policy we have, exacerbates all of those things that I just mentioned, and in fact makes them much worse. And so what I want to do today is share for you how this has played out both in Pennsylvania but also nationally, and perhaps to get us to really reflect on what the moral and ethical implications of this massive policy that we embarked on really uh, the close of the 1960s has meant for us, for our communities, for our economy. And I want to suggest to you, uh, actually for our very democracy, the things that we hold very uh, dear as citizens. Indeed, I want to suggest to you that mass incarceration has, in short, eroded our cities and has really undermined our economy and, as importantly, has really distorted our democratic process. <laughs> to explain all of this, though, I need to give a little bit of background, and that is to say that um, as the 20th century ended and the 21st century began, something took place in the United States that was really internationally unparalleled but also historically unprecedented within this country. And that is to say that between 1970 and 2010, more people were incarcerated in this country than at any point in our recorded past, but also, as importantly, more than any other country on the globe. And at no time in our history had our nation's sort of basic policies and basic practices become so bound up with a politics of punishment as opposed to other ways of dealing with social issues. Indeed, by 2007, more than 7.5 million Americans had become entangled in this criminal justice system in some way. The prison population of that year, by that year had increased more rapidly than had the resident population as a whole, with one in every 31 US residents under some form of correctional supervision. And indeed, one way to think about this is by 2011, 65 million Americans had some form of a criminal record. So just kind of absorb that figure for a moment. In Pennsylvania, this meant that by 2011, about 52,000 people were locked up. But it meant as significantly that about 350,000 of them were under some form of correctional control, which I'll explain to you why that's significant. And indeed, as I think we all know, this is not just any population, right? This is, a deeply, uh, this is a deeply racialized crisis. This is a population overwhelmingly of color. Indeed, eventually one in nine young African American men would be ens ensnared in the system, and staggeringly, a large number of uh, black women now, way disproportionate to white women, are also in the system. And what's really kind of interesting about this is we in the North, I say Pennsylvania, uh, I'm actually from Detroit, so the Midwest, but still North. We take great pride in, in uh, thinking of ourselves as a more racially tolerant part of the country, for example, than the South. But you might want to know that indeed in Pennsylvania, the racial disparities in, in incarceration are far worse than they are even in the Deep South. 
In Alabama, the uh, black to white ratio of uh, incarceration is about three to one. In Pennsylvania, it's about nine to one. Mm -hmm. To just kind of give you a sense of what we're dealing with here. And yet, despite these little facts I've given you, American citizens have done very little thinking about this policy that we embarked on. One that took enormous resources out of other sectors of our uh, society. And so I think it's, I want to suggest, I think for all kinds of reasons, moral and ethic, the primary ones, we reconsider this. And I say this because, of course, politicians now are talking about this has become a system that's too expensive. We might want to get rid of it because it costs too much money. And indeed, there's a much touted kind of coalition between conservatives and progressives coming together to talk about getting rid of uh, such high rates of incarceration. <laughs> But I actually think that unless we really consider the moral and ethical dimensions of this, we're in trouble. Because the minute that in budgets improve, the minute we can figure out some way, other way of doing this, you can be sure we will. And so that's my, uh, my uh, pitch, if nothing else, for today. So one of the things I want to suggest to you is that when we think about mass incarceration critically, it actually helps us to understand what's happened to our cities in a whole different way. Um, Pennsylvania is uh, no different than any other state, uh, although Philadelphia has a little bit more of a vibrancy to its inner city than some of the places I've traveled around the country, like, for example, Detroit, where I'm from. Many American cities, right, over the last 30 to 40 years have been very much eroded, right? In fact, cities become the place that very few people want to live. We've seen a major exodus out to the suburbs. We see cities becoming synonymous in people's mind with danger and erosion and, uh, and devastation. Um, and we have lots of explanations for this. Um, some people say, you know, well, we had, you know, massive white flyer. We had uh, various urban rebellions in cities that sent people scurrying. Or we have deindustrialization that kind of eroded cities. And I'm not here to quibble with any of those arguments, but what I am just here to say is that we've really underestimated how much this policy, this criminal justice policy we've embarked on also has had an impact, a very negative impact on our cities. The mass incarceration that began in the 1960s, in fact, was really premised on something that in my work I call the criminalization of urban space. And this was a process by which greater and greater numbers of urbanites became subject to a greater and greater number of laws made certain things illegal that had not been illegal before, and actually made the penalty for things that had been illegal before much more severe. Now, I'm gonna flesh this out in just a moment. Let me back up, though, and ask a question that I know that is on many people's minds, which is, why now? Why do we do this? Why all of a sudden do we criminalize urban space? Why did we begin this war on crime in the 1960s? And in our popular lore, and much of our popular memory even, we think, well, However regrettable the situation we ended up with, we began this because we had a horrible crime problem in our cities, right, in the 1960s and the 1970s. Well, it turns out that if we actually historicize crime, that is to say actually go back year by year and figure out what was really going on, we notice something pretty interesting, which is that we actually begin the war on crime in 1965, not with Nixon, you might be surprised to know, but actually with Lyndon Johnson, when he begins the Law Enforcement Administration uh, Act and then uh, uh, the Law Enforcement uh, Assistance Administration, that creates the apparatus to have a major war on crime. Now this is in 1965. Actually, in 1965, the murder rate and even the violent crime rate was at an all-time low. In fact, it hadn't quite been that low since about 1910. So you might say, well, what's going on here? What's going on? in the height of our war on crime. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But we begin a war on crime in large part because across this nation, as the civil rights movement is erupting in the South and then moves north, many politicians begin to conflate urban disorder with crime and a rejection of societal values and a, and a, and a kind of disruptive culture. So it's not insignificant that Philadelphia, as we know, uh, ex North Philadelphia explodes in 1964, many other parts of the country, Rochester, and we begin to see a call for much more uh, law enforcement, much greater control of urban spaces. This happens in the south, it happens in the north. And what's really interesting is that we begin to see all of a sudden this rhetoric of crime come up when it's quite disproportionate to what's actually happening. 
Interestingly, uh, I'm a historian, so I have to just throw this out here. This isn't the first time this happened. Right after the Civil War, right, we had four million newly freed people who were also demanding greater, greater civil rights, access to housing, access to the vote, access to all these things. And across the South, what happens is, all of a sudden, urban, rural spaces in this case, are criminalized in new ways. Things are made illegal that had not been made legal, illegal before. Penalties increase for things that had been illegal. And so, for example, in the state of Georgia, the Georgia State Penitentiary goes from being 100% white in 1865. By 1895, it's almost 100% black. And notably, it's not because white folks stop committing crimes, and it's not because black folks lose their mind. It's because of a policy decision. And this very much happens in the 1960s. Now, we know, though, that crime does start to escalate. And one of the reasons for that is that part of building this war on crime was a war on drugs, right? We begin, with the, the most massive part of the war on crime was a revolution in drug legislation. Indeed, whereas there had only been about 322,000 drug-related arrests in 1970, by 2000, 1,400,000 drug-related arrests. So remember what I said about ordinary behaviors becoming criminalized in new ways. This has a profound effect on cities, as you might imagine. And what's notable, if I had some graphs here I could show you, this is overwhelmingly a population that is not being arrested for sales, it's being arrested for possession. In fact, it's a quite staggering. And of course, this is a very racially disproportionate uh, situation as well. So these are addicts more than pushers. In Pennsylvania in 1980, there was about 14,000 drug arrests. In Pennsylvania by 2007, there was about 59,000 arrests. So it gives you a sense of what's happening here. As importantly, we overhauled state and federal sentencing guidelines. You all know in Pennsylvania, for example, if you get a life sentence now, life means life. There's no possibility of parole, right? We know that in Pennsylvania, we actually have the dubious distinction of having uh, about 450 children that were sentenced under life without the possibility of parole. Um, and this is a phenomenally new policy moment, right? This has just never happened before anywhere else. And of course, again, this is a deeply racialized situation. The urban locale that actually experienced this new criminalization more directly, perhaps more immediately, across this country than any other was our nation's urban schools. And again, you only have to look at Philadelphia to see what this has meant. By 2011, the school district of Philadelphia boasted a security force of about 657 personnel, including 408 school police officers and 249 school security officers. And all these new relationships between schools and the DA's office, right, and schools and the courts. And this is, again, a completely new thing. You might not be interested to know, we didn't have police in the schools until Baltimore, 1969, Atlanta, 1969, Detroit, 1969, <laughs> Philadelphia, I believe it was 1968, I won't be quoted on that. But what's happening here is the first schools to get police in them are these schools that are erupting in civil rights protests, right? And they're asking for integration, they're asking for uh, more African American studies courses and things like that. So it's very interesting how this starts. One might imagine, though, that everything I just described tears at the social fabric of cities, right? In short, if you lock up record numbers of people, if you remove record numbers of people from their neighborhood, largely for nonviolent crimes and largely for, for crimes of public health, that is to say, drug addiction, rather than, uh, we're not talking about arresting Noriega, for example, right? <laughs> uh, we're talking about very low level stuff it tears at the social fabric of cities. And in fact, it creates a situation in many cities across the country, but in certain pockets of other cities, like Philadelphia, called million dollar blocks. Have any of you heard of million dollar blocks? So if you drive to North Philadelphia, where Temple is, you might notice that it just seems absolutely ravaged. It blocks and blocks and blocks where it seems that nobody lives, it just, it just seems absolutely decimated. That is a million dollar block. Philadelphia has the dubious distinction of having that term used in that area. And what it means is that's what it costs to incarcerate all the people that used to live there. <laughs> but they don't live there anymore. Now, that's a very conservative term, right? It's not really a million dollar block. It's more like multi-million dollar blocks. 
And it's not true that nobody lives there, but what is true is that the people left behind there, right, are newly impoverished, parents have been taken out. And so another phenomenon is that mass incarceration has created an orphaning of America's children. A very dramatic, actually, orphaning of America's children, and has really created enormous tensions on, for example, the foster care system and so forth. Indeed, one of the reasons for this, we have about 10 million children now that we might consider in this framework, and it's because mothers are now being inc incarcerated at much higher rates. You know, when you're incarcerated, you're taken very far away. Here in Philadelphia, you might go to Greaterford or someplace very far away, and if you don't see your child for 15 months in many states across the country, you immediately lose parental rights. And so this is another very significant way in which families are undercut and eroded. And indeed, of course, we know that even if parents come back, what's the first thing they need to take care of these children when they come back? They need a job, right? And every study, nevertheless, indicates that the ability to get a job is it's a very high bar, right? And that's in part because, and in no small part because, we now have a policy that when you have uh, an employment application, you have to declare, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Actually, some applications now say, have you ever been accused of a crime? Which one wonders on the Constitution of that. <laughs> uh, but, but have you ever been convicted of a crime? So this is kind of this in perpetuity uh, phenomenon that when you have a criminal record, it's almost impossible to find employment. Now in our society, when you can't find employment, we have a welfare state. It's nowhere near the welfare state that we have in Canada even, or in many parts of Europe, but it is nevertheless, we have a welfare apparatus. And that's what's supposed to kick in if someone cannot find employment. But because of these new relationships now between the welfare system and the criminal justice system, that is not an option either, because if you have a drug conviction in state after state across this country, you also do not qualify for aid. So the bottom line here is you start to see with this combination of pulling people out of cities, orphaning of children, no money, no jobs, no welfare, right? We begin to understand the phenomenon by which so many of our neighborhoods across America <coughs> are being ground down. And I might say also that there's all kinds of hidden costs to cities as well. Public health costs, for example. One of the things that such overcrowding in prisons has done is it's created, for example, a major problem with tuberculosis and AIDS and all kinds of diseases that, of course, when people get out, that just also goes into the community. So, for example, New York City had a pretty horrendous uh, tuberculosis epidemic in the 80s, and it was traced directly back to Rikers Island, where people had mm -hmm. gotten out. Um, right, we've all heard of MRSA in the hospital. We're all very afraid of MRSA, getting that horrible anti uh, antibiotic resistant strain of bacteria. Well, in certain states, that's apparently been traced directly to the prison system, right, where overcrowded prisons are treating prisoners inadequately with antibiotics, so it's kind of this breeding ground for MRSA, believe it or not. So there's all these, I mean, the, the ethical implications of this for society as a whole, we're just beginning to peel this onion and to, to really understand it. So with these hidden costs and with these very explicit costs, we can begin to see that the costs for our nation's cities have been very high. And they're not value-free costs. They're not just economic costs, right? They are costs that, that affect our schools, that affect our communities, that affect our children, and that affect our neighborhoods at the most basic, basic level. I want to suggest to you, just moving through this, that it also has enormous implications for our economy. And what's interesting is that this too has a 19th century corollary. Remember when I said that after the Civil War, we changed laws, we, we arrested people at record levels uh, for new, new things that were illegal and gave them record time. Well, the other thing we did was we put them to work. We've all heard of convict leasing, presumably. Some of the most egregious form of labor exploitation that ineffectively in the South kept slavery going, uh, arguably for uh, several generations and really built the New South. Well, what's really interesting is the same thing happens when we get mass incarceration in the 1960s. In fact, after the Civil War, between the Civil War and between the New Deal, we had a horrible situation with convict leasing, but when we get the New Deal and we get Roosevelt, we actually put all kinds of wonderful regulations in place. 
So that, for example, there was still work being done in prisons, some job training, some internal work, but you couldn't sell prison-made goods across state lines. There were certain barriers, right, to kind of cut down on this exploitation and also cut down on the job competition. Well, no sooner did we change the laws in the 60s that led to this mass incarceration, but then all of a sudden we started to change the laws that were barriers to prison labor again. And in 1979, we overhauled all those laws. And so we began to see a major accessing of prison labor again. Now, let me be clear, there's nothing wrong with labor. We all labor, and, and work is okay, and work is good. It's actually very fulfilling. But the problem here is the return of exploitation. Because again, there's this ethical conundrum where if you work people but you don't pay them sufficiently, right? They can't feed their children, which in turn puts other strains on society, but it's also taking work out of the major economy where people who are not in the system work. So we have this other crazy situation. Pennsylvania is another one of these states where this is really front and center. We have uh, our, in our Pennsylvania correctional industries, we do everything, carpentry, reupholstering furniture, refinishing, engraving, compact <laughs> disc duplication. Mm. <laughs> I mean, the list really goes on. It's quite extraordinary. In fact, someone was telling me that, you know, the, the, the no parking signs and the handicap signs and these kind, all the kind of signage that we're just so used to seeing is coming out of this. And, of course, there's another component to this, which is not just the work, right, that's going into prisons, but it's also the actual privatizations of prisons themselves. And I, and I have to pause here to really think through, again, the ethics of this. Because once it became possible to access this huge supply of incarcerated people, we also had an enormous incentive to build prisons to house them, and to make enormous amounts of money in doing so. You've all heard, perhaps, in Pennsylvania, the Cash for Kids scandal. That was a private juvenile facility that was giving kickbacks to the judge to basically sell these kids into this institution. Well, that's the most egregious case. But I do want to suggest that as we have moved towards a situation where we can privatize prisons, and we're doing it across this nation, in fact, the entire Florida system is privatized, we've just put a whole new incentive in there, and dare I say it, to have crime continue. We need the beds filled, which means what? I mean, let's call it out for what it is. If you own one of those companies, it is in your financial interest that someone is victimized. It's a pretty powerful thing to say, but at the end of the day, that is what it means. And so we have now companies that service prisons, build prisons. As I say in some of my other pieces, Everything from tampons to, ta to tasers to telephones. There is money to be made. And make no mistake about it, the same companies that are hoping to make that money and do make that money are intimately also involved in the legislative process. And I'm not making a conspiracy theory here. This is well known. Uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council brings together all kinds of companies that draft legislation to, for example, keep mandatory minimums, not roll back the Rockefeller drug laws, and so forth. And many of that lobbying effort is coming directly from the private prison corporations or corporations that invest in prisons. So there's an enormous economic implication of this. Because guess what? It's not just about those inside or the money to be made on for those inside. It's about all of us on the outside. You know, um, when we had the BP oil spill, for example, Remember that, that horrendous situation? The unemployment rate is extremely high in the Gulf region, but guess who did all that cleanup? Prisoners. And prisoners did that cleanup because they didn't have much choice. And also the OSHA regulations for prisoners are a little bit easier to, you know, dance around a little bit. But it isn't just that. It is also, for example, does everyone remember Scott Walker in Wisconsin getting, you know, battling public sector unions, for example. Yeah. One of the reasons Scott Walker was able to do that is because of prison labor. Because of this wellspring of possible laborers to come in as janitors, as street cleaners, as the people to do that public <coughs> sector work. And he was very explicit about that. So when we think mm -hmm. about the jobs that go, there's estimates now about, about 800,000 jobs that are now done by inmates. But that income is not made by them, 
And the income's not made by the people on the outside who used to reupholster that furniture or make those signs or do whatever. And so someone's making a lot of money, but it's not the society as a whole. And in fact, the drain on the society as a whole is quite severe. I want to leave you with a final question, though, and kind of walk through this as I close. And that is, if this is all so bad, if everything I've told you is true, and indeed, you, I think you can trust me on this, even Eric Holder in the uh, Attorney General's office has come out against the most, uh, you know, some of the most important contributors to mass incarceration, such as these mandatory minimums. I think it's on our agenda, as I've said today, to talk about. But, but if it's so bad, why haven't we fixed it? How have we been in a policy for 40 years that has taken so many resources out of the public good, out of communities, out of schools, <coughs> out of foster care, out of welfare, and by the way, out of ordinary things like road building and school lunch programs and just your basic human service programs. And how could that have happened? A, without us anybody paying attention. And B, how does it still happen with no one changing it? Why is there not this kind of wellspring of what's going on here? And there's some really interested, interesting reasons for that. One of the reasons is that the people most affected by this, the seven and a half million people who are ensnared in the system currently, that's you know, on probation, on parole, you know, somehow still ensnared, or the 65 million people that have some kind of, you know, one in four Americans that have some kind of a criminal record, they haven't done it. Or at least the people who are felons haven't done it. And by the way, do you have to commit a serious crime to be a felon in this country? No. no. The reason is because of something called disfranchisement. At the bottom line, the very people most affected by this crisis have been unable to change it in our most time-honored tradition in this country, which is through the ballot box. That is to say, change the laws that create this. That is to say, overhaul the situation. Now again, this has a 19th century corollary which is sort of interesting, because remember after the Civil War, not only did we change laws and lock up people in record numbers, all African Americans, and we put those people to work, which took work away from the free world, but also superly exploited the people on the inside, but we passed disfranchisement laws across the South. And it was a wonderful way of maintaining power in the South after the Civil War, as we know, for about 100 years, right? Until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But here's the thing. We all celebrate the Voting Rights Act of 65, right? Civil rights, yes. But the same year that we passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, remember what I say, we built a war on crime. The same year, right? We create LEA, the Law Enforcement Administration Act, the same year we passed the Voting Rights Act. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that something happens while we're all asleep at the wheel which is that we slowly begin to erode that very right in ways that we never thought about. No one was paying attention. No one was challenging. And indeed, so serious was this that in 1973, it goes before the Supreme Court in a very important case called Richardson versus Ramirez, a challenge to this idea that you could disfranchise people with records. And the Supreme Court, in a very unfortunate and tortured reading of the 14th Amendment decides it's perfectly okay to disfranchise people with a criminal record. Well, that's never a good idea, but it's less of a good idea when you have two and a half million people locked up and seven and a half million people in the system and increasing number of things that are fel felonies, right? So by 2006, 48 out of 50 states had disfranchised in some former fashion, the formerly incarcerated population, right? So this is gonna change everything. It's gonna change the way our democracy works. But it's actually worse than that. Because it isn't just felon disfranchisement, it's also the way that our census works. Now we all know the census. Census comes around every 10 years and we all sign the box and how many people do we have living in our house and it's a great employer because it gets to get people out on the street for these temporary jobs. 
But the census is actually vitally important for all kinds of other reasons, right? We know, for example, that the census is what determines our representation at the state level, right? Who represents us in Harrisburg in this case? It matters that Philadelphia, for example, keeps its population, right? Because if you dip under a million people, <coughs> as Detroit did, all of a sudden you don't have any political power in your state anymore, right? So census matters for political representation. Census also matters economically. How do you think we figure out, for example, whether we need X dollars for a child nutrition program in our schools? Actually, how do we figure out a lot of our local funding questions through the census, right? But here is the thing. The US Census counts prisoners where they are locked up, not where they're from. Now, before mass incarceration, this actually was always the case, but it wasn't a particular crisis. It did not change our democracy. But in the wake of mass incarceration, it is a direct dilution of our democracy in ways that are just staggering. Eight house districts in Pennsylvania, eight, would not meet the one person vote rule, federal minimum rule for districts without prisoners. So what does this mean? It means that if a person gets arrested in North Philadelphia and they get locked up in Greaterford, right, their body is counted for political power in the, dare I say it, all white area around Greaterford. Can they vote? No. Does this also have a 19th century eerie echo? The three-fifths clause, anyone hear of that? No. Where black bodies count for white political power, but they can't vote themselves? So in Pennsylvania, but it isn't just Pennsylvania, we could I talk around the country, no, no matter what state I am in, I have a wonderful anecdote, a horrifying anecdote, really, about how many votes have been distorted in a given state. So the person in North Philadelphia who's living in the million dollar block that has been utterly decimated by these policies has no vote. But the people who build the prison, the people who work in the prison, the people who are fed by the prison have political power. And were it that simple that it was, again, just the politics, the distortion of democracy, it also literally means that dollars go from districts here to districts there. Mm -hmm. And so that goes a long way to explaining how it is that we can have a system so devastating and yet so impervious to change at the ballot box. But I want to leave you with one other thought. Because it's actually not up to, every, it's up to all of us, right? It's not just up to the people who can't vote. Why hasn't everyone else changed it? Why hasn't everyone else, why do we even know about it, let alone change it? Right? Well, first of all, prisons are meant to be out of sight, out of mind. So in part, we don't know about it because we don't have to know about it. <laughs> Although, I must say that's changing. And even for lots and lots of white kids, especially poor white kids, this is changing because of the meth ep epidemic, right? The addiction epidemic, let's be clear. And so many more white kids are now serving life sentences without parole. And so, I mean, the, the demographics of this are changing. And many more families are having to think about this. And I would actually submit that if all of us closed our eyes for a moment and thought about our families, <coughs> no matter how old we are, no matter what our gender, no matter what our race, we all know somebody, in fact, maybe that wasn't locked up for 30 years, but, <coughs> but had a drug addiction, that very easily could have been locked up, right? Had they been seeking drugs in the wrong part of town, or maybe someone who we know who was arrested, but had a really good lawyer. I always say to my, my, my students at Temple, I have a huge lecture of 200 of them. And they're all you know, ready to lock them up. And you know, they're all very tough on crime. And I say, let me just ask you a question here. If the Philadelphia Police Department came in just right about now <laughs> and uh, stopped and frisked all of you, <laughs> how many of you would be uh, spending the night down at the, uh, whatever it is, the Round House? The Round House, exactly, the Round House. <laughs> 
And they all kind of nervously laugh and kind of check their pockets and wonder what's going on. But then the next question is just as important, which is how many of you will be out by midnight because someone's going to bail you out and someone's going to make sure you have a lawyer and someone's going to make sure this doesn't screw up your whole life. And there's a whole lot of other nervous tittering around the room, right? So the fact of the matter is we do think about crime and punishment. It is part of our lives, but we've been trained to not think about it. It's someone else's problem. It's far away, the prison is far away, but perhaps even more insidiously, we have come to believe that this is the solution to our public safety concerns. Because at the end of the day, we all want to be safe, right? Nobody wants to be victimized. And by the way, I take victimization very, very seriously. And I'll finish this thought, which is, we believe that mass incarceration has made us safer. We don't like it, maybe, we don't really want to think about Graterford Prison, but Lord help us if there's going to be, if we're going to save someone from something awful, then uh, I guess we have to have it. But here's what's interesting. We know the story on this. The statisticians, the sociologists, the experts, they know the story on this, which is this. The incarceration rate over the last 40 years has gone straight up. The crime rate goes like this. They are disaggregated. That is to say, they are moved and shaped by different things. Now, right now, we all feel kind of good because we've been hearing that the violent crime rate is way down nationally. And it's at an all-time low. And we feel good about that. And frankly, we don't like mass incarceration, but we kind of like to keep it like that. I mean, let's be honest. Going to New York City now, I was there last night, and you know, you can go to Times Square and you can walk around with your kids and you can go to Toys R Us and they can ride the mirror around or whatever, the, the, uh, the Ferris wheel in there and it all feels very safe. But the thing is, this is a shell game. Because the communities who are most fragile, the communities that are most in trouble have not experienced this. In fact, the violence rate is still and actually has become <coughs> catastrophic in many of our nation's most fragile communities. And that is because mass incarceration is criminogenic. That is to say, it creates the conditions that create, I don't want to say crime because crime is something that, you know, the definitions of it change over time, but creates violence. Because when people are hungry, and when people don't have parents, and when people don't have an education, and when people are desperate, awful things happen. So we know that public safety is not advanced by incarceration. In fact, it is actually harmed by incarceration. So when I say a shell game, we can go to Times Square and feel really wonderful, but you're not gonna wanna go to certain areas of Bed-Stuy. You're not gonna wanna go to certain other areas where all of that has been pushed, marginalized, intensified. So we come back to the moral and the ethics of this, which is that if we think of ourselves as a huge society, not as an individual, right? If we think of ourselves as part of a large community, not my community, or your community, or their community, but the community, then public safety starts to look really differently. And mass incarceration starts to look extremely costly. And things like violence and crime start to get very complicated. And things like our democracy start to feel like they're in jeopardy. And things like our cities start to seem more fragile than they ever have. And our economy more fragile than it ever has been. And so I hope that I've persuaded you, or at least opened up the discussion that I hope we can continue today, about why I think that mass incarceration matters a great deal, not just economically, not just politically, but indeed morally and ethically ethically so that when we do begin to decarcerate, because we will, because it's unsustainable, because it's a project that we can't fund in perpetuity, but if we don't consider this human dimension, we will tether people instead, we'll still disfranchise them, we'll still prevent them from having a political voice, we still won't put that money into drug treatment, we still won't fund our foster care system, We'll figure out a different way to do punishment. And I think that we know historically that that's the case.
And so I do think it's something that we as citizens should embrace as a very important civil rights issue to talk about. Thank you. Thank you.